Hey gay, this video is brought to you by my patrons at Patreon. If you want to support this channel and the broader homosexual agenda, the best way to keep these videos going is to contribute to my Patreon at patreon.com slash are they gay. If not, consider visiting my merch store at www.itsall.gay, where you can let the world know you act gaily daily. I don't think Harry Styles should have to publicly divulge his sexuality, but I do think he deserves criticism for tone-deaf statements about a community he refuses to fully align himself with, except when it gets him press. Interesting. Harry Styles has the life, makes mediocre music, pretends to be gay, and gets so much p because of it. Dude's a queer bait icon. No one's doing it like him. We should stone him. Homophobic TV show writers wish they could queer bait as well as Harry Styles. When Harry Styles will suck d live on Instagram, maybe then I'll consider him to not queer bait. The fact that people who are not MLM on Twitter are accusing every man of queer baiting when they do anything that challenges male gender roles or do anything that isn't typically heterosexual is definitely a problem we need to address. Just saying. It's time. Harry Styles, queer baiting, two words that propel the most annoying conversation on earth. How did we get here? Harry Edward Styles first rose to power at the age of 16 for his participation in the British social experiment known as One Direction. Since the inception and conclusion of the direction of one, Harry Styles and his relationships have centrally occupied the imagination of gay people, for better or worse. Since leaving One Direction, Harry released three well-received albums, wore a few dresses, and as of late, became the center of a controversy. Queer baiting. People often throw it around to signify their anger when they believe people or brands disingenuinely use hints of queer symbols and culture to bait queer audiences for their money and loyalty. The word has haunted Mr. Styles since 2018, when he first garnered some media attention for allegedly using ambiguous queerness to profit from queer fans as a, in this version of the story, straight man. And how could one return from such accusations? A straight man? In current year? I mean, grow up. Nevertheless, the accusations fizzled away until recently, when Harry made a few comments. So much our gay sex in film is two guys going at it, and it kind of removes the tenderness from it, Styles continues. There will be, I would imagine, some people who watch it who were very much alive during this time when it was illegal to be gay, and Michael wanted to show that it's tender and loving and sensitive. Okay, I'll just briefly state that Harry must be pretty ignorant of queer film history to say something as harmfully generalizing as so much of gay sex in film is two guys going at it. And even if that were true, the quote slightly implies that we should stop making films about guys going at it. But watching dudes going at it is kind of awesome. But I can do a critique of this quote justice, and it isn't exactly relevant to the story other than being a catalyst for the return of Harry Styles' queerbaiting accusations. For the accusers, Harry crossed the line in bringing forth such an opinion about queer media despite him being, in the eyes of critics, a straight man who plays up the gay for money. I mean, who does he think he is, 2010's Darren Chris? No respect. <clears throat> and just to clear questions of bias, I'm not a Harry Styles fan. I don't even listen to music that's not my album, October Conspiracy, out now on all platforms, link in the description. I'm generally lukewarm. I like some songs on Harry's house. That's about the extent of my personal investments. I'm only invested in this story because Harry is a part of a trend. Harry isn't the first and probably isn't the last celebrity to be criticized for alleged queer baiting. Among the accused are Billie Eilish, Charlie Puth, Nick Jonas, John Mendes, Burton Ernie, and more. Are these people actually queer baiters? Or did I just list a nightmare blunt rotation for nothing? Wait, I forgot not all of you are gay zoomers, so I'll have to explain to you prunes out there what queer baiting is. So let me take you through what queer baiting is and isn't, how we can improve the current definition, how we can mobilize critique in effective ways, and how we can reconceptualize queerness in a way that doesn't contribute to strangling ideological regimes. Let's start by defining and refining queerbaiting. Mm. 
The term queerbaiting first emerged in 2010's fandom spaces to formalize the musings of neurotic 14-year-old internet bisexuals. <coughs> Discourse online surrounded criticisms of shows like Merlin, Sherlock, Supernatural, and Teen Wolf for the purported use of gay subtext to lure gay viewers through the false promise of gay representation. The idea was, entice gay people with ambiguous staring, gay jokes, touches, and all sorts of gay subtext. And once the gays take the bait, continue along heterosexually, never confirm the gay subtext, and revel in your Tumblr bucks. Put simply, during the Tumblr fandom era, queer baiting, the unfulfilled promise of queer representation, was the big boogeyman looming over gifts of white men touching each other. In a post-Tumblr fandom era world, the term queerbaiting has taken on a life of its own. The definition is a little vague. Queerbaiting is when you lure gay people into liking stuff they think is gay but isn't actually gay. Is it? Well, if queerbaiting is going to leave Tumblr blogs and enter academia as it has over the past decade, we have to be specific about our terms so that we can effectively utilize them in critique. Or pick group quote tweets. My proposition. Queerbaiting only works as a critique because of a specific relationship that queer subtext has to film history, and that it doesn't make sense to move out of an on-screen context into the realm of real people. Let me outline that film history briefly. Okay, no, we're, we're not gonna do that. Back in the 1920s, Hollywood was pretty gay and out there, and some people didn't like that. So in the 1930s, a bunch of people got together and said, Pfft, economic collapse. Instead of reconsidering why our economy just kind of implodes every seven years, what if we stop letting gay people? And so Hollywood created the Motion Picture Production Code. The code outlined a bunch of stuff that movies couldn't do. Their policy towards gay people? Don't, unless they're evil. So from the 1930s to the early 60s, the Motion Picture Production Code limited Hollywood's portrayal of homosexuality to subtext and villainy. Working under the censorship of the code, directors like Alfred Hitchcock perfected the art of villainous gay subtext in films like Rope and Strangers on a Train. Hitchcock's intention in using queer subtext was to make homophobic audiences of the 40s and 50s uncomfortable, fitting with the spooky vibes of his flicks. Later in the 60s, though, some Supreme Court cases made people stop caring about gay people doing stuff in movies, and studios became slightly more lenient on the homoeroticism. Now, uh, explicit mentions of fingers going into holes? No way, too neo-Marxist. Studios still wanted to keep their gaze subtextual. In this period of film history, queer screenwriters like Gore Vidal further developed the language of gay subtext in film. You got very good at projecting subtext without saying a word about what you were doing. Highly influential films like Ben-Hur, Lawrence of Arabia, and Spartacus subtly portrayed homoerotic subtext in their films, further solidifying gay undertones as an institutional and organized practice. Just as Hollywood became an established mass cultural institution, Hollywood censorship forced writers and directors to establish an institutionalized and recognizable subtextual cinematic homosexuality. Hollywood had learned to write movies between the lines, and some members of the audience had learned to watch them that way. Now, in the contemporary period, sprinkling queer subtext into your favorite mediocre British TV show isn't a process individual screenwriters improvise situationally. Queer subtext is an established film language with a history, and none of us are outside this history. Every time we watch any movie, we're in conversation with the history of film and the norms that have been established through this cinematic history. So when queer audiences pick up on the subtext in a show like Sherlock, they're not just picking up on the subtext in Sherlock, these audiences are in conversation with the very specific and established history of queer subtext. I didn't just observe that stare between Sherlock and John. I'm also gazing upon the stare between these two Fruit Loops and Rope, between these Nancy boys and Ben-Hur. This subtextual cinematic homoerotic stare is a signifier that transcends a single movie or TV show. Right, uh, so queerbaiting. The thing where there's gay subtext but no gay delivery, also known as a John Mulaney joke. Queerbaiting only works as a critical term because cinematic queer subtext specifically 
has a unique language and history. Queer people are especially fluent in this language. Limp wrist, gay guy. Woman in hat, lesbian. 2000s teenager with bleached hair who's into theater, twink. Homosexual penetration? Actually, I don't know about We associate certain images with lesbi-queerosexuals to the point where the images, or signs, constitute a type of language of subtext. When shows start speaking the language of queer subtext but fail to confirm the queer subtext in the text through a kiss or a well-placed finger, well, people start to feel icky. Why is queer baiting bad? What's the actual mechanism of its badness? Isn't subverting viewers' expectations actually kind of cool and awesome? Over the course of my many years online, I'm not old, I was just scarred at a young age, I've come across several definitions of queerbaiting. One is the most popular but limited reading of queerbaiting, and the other, at least I think, is the best version I can come up with. And you can trust me because I'm wearing glasses. Both definitions of queerbaiting come from similar foundations. They both agree that the queerbaiting strategy involves the presentation of historically established queer cultural signifiers for malicious purposes. Showrunners present eye sex for money. But the definitions differ in articulating which part of the queerbaiting process is problematic. So I call the limited but popular narrative of queerbaiting the exchange theory of queerbaiting. In this flawed narrative, Queerbaiting is a media strategy whereby media entities promise, through gay subtext, the exchange of one good, gay representation, for another, a gay audience. But these media entities fail to deliver on this exchange. And you can trust me because I have a chalkboard. You might think this version of queerbaiting sounds reasonable enough. It sounds nice and tweetable and or publishable in a low-ranked sociology journalable to me. Why do I think this version is actually a little flawed? Problem one, I'm homophobic. Wait, problem one, it presents a paradox. Under the exchange theory of queerbaiting, how do people usually prove that queerbaiting is happening? Well, queer audiences point to queer subtext as proof that creators promise to exchange gay subtext for confirmed and explicit representation. Audiences go, hey, you're using the queer language of subtext established so uniquely in 20th century film history. Does this mean your show is queer? If the response from creators is somewhere in between no and you gay people cooties, then you have a queerbait. According to this exchange theory of queerbaiting, the queer audience, lured by the queer subtext, rightfully expects something in exchange for their loyalty. But think about it. In this exchange analysis of queerbaiting, the creator promises to deliver queer representation as this sort of product to the audience. But what is this ideal delivery supposed to look like, according to the theory? If queerbaiting is framed under the premise of an exchange between audiences and creators, then this also assumes that, in a fair exchange, the ideal representation of queerness must have some specific form recognized as fair by both parties. Usually the form of explicit gay confirmation via kiss or love confession. Yet this idea that queer media can only look like textual confirmation is exactly what any theory of queerbaiting denies. Blah blah gay people blah blah post-structuralism. The fundamental principle behind any theory of queerbaiting is that throughout history, queerness on screen has been both a textual and subtextual phenomenon. Queerbaiting only works when creators utilize this subtextual history to hint at queer representation and lure gay viewers. Remember, the gay stare of John and Sherlock is also the gay stare of Rope and Ben-Hur. Critiques of the practice of queerbaiting lose their weight without the subtextual history of queerness on film, because queerbaiting can only be practiced when it's in conversation with the subtextual language created by queer film history. Queerness on film and subtextual queerness on film share the same history, right? So would it not be denying this history to say that the representation of queer subtext is not itself a type of representation of queerness? Whether what we call subtext fulfills the souls and minds of modern audiences is a separate question. What we face here is a descriptive problem. What does it mean to represent queerness? 
Why do we privilege some representations of queerness over others? Why do some think that explicit queerness is somehow closer to the truth or core of queerness than implicit queerness is? In a way, hasn't the majority of queer history been implicit in the way that queerness has been historically unnamed and unclassified and unstated? How can explicit and named queerness be closer to true queerness when the word homosexual didn't even exist until the late 19th century? Huh. For decades, queerness has been told through the language of subtext. And to speak this language of queer subtext in a contemporary work like Sherlock, for example, is itself a type of representation of queer culture and history. Queer subtext is a type of queer representation. Is it as good as the 66,000 John Locke fanfics on AO3? Debatable, but nevertheless, subtext itself represents a part of queer history. Is it good representation? Is it bad? That's not the argument. The argument is that queer subtext represents some part of queer history in some way. Exchange theorists of queer baiting critique queer baiting creators by saying stuff like, this work isn't providing queer audiences with queer representation despite promising to do so through the queer subtext in the work. But that's the same as saying, this work isn't providing queer representation. My proof of this is the queer representation in the work. It's a contradiction. To resolve that contradiction, an exchange theorist might then have to claim that explicit queer text is somehow more legitimate than queer subtext. Well, in that case, then the queer baiting creator can turn that back around and say, well, it's just subtext, huh? And since subtext is less legitimate than text, then you can't hold anything in the subtext against me. Our criticisms of queer baiting need queer subtext to hold legitimacy as a form of queer representation if we want the critique of queer baiting to make sense. And queer subtext should hold weight. We shouldn't forget our history. Now, another possible rebuttal to this paradox probably goes something like, okay, well, sure. These shows provide a type of queer representation through subtext, but this subtext emerged out of a time of homophobic censorship. Queer audiences would be more fulfilled if creators portrayed explicit and unambiguous confirmations of queer relationships on par with the explicit representation achieved by heterosexual relationships on screen. And that brings us to problem two with the exchange theory of queer baiting. Problem two, I hate gay people. Problem two. It reinforces heteronormative film practices. The exchange theory of queer baiting ultimately reinforces Western heterosexual film tropes. The desire for explicit representation is a trap. Okay, before gears become ground, I'll start that by qualifying that, yes, I acknowledge that explicit queer representation is important to me. You know what, screw this. I just wanna provide you with a different way of looking at representation. If you don't like it, then go watch some other twink with glasses. So, how is the desire for explicit representation as we know it cucked? It'll take a bit of sociology masquerading as literary theory to explain. Let's go to office hours. The desire for explicit representation inherently implies that queer representation only holds value in terms of coming out of the closet through on-screen words or gay actions. An exchange theorist of queer baiting might claim that media that only presents queer subtext without an out of the closet moment is media that queer baits. I'm not sure if I agree with this whole exchange way of thinking. My parasocial pal, Judith Butler, once commented on something like this. The legendary philosopher, queer theorist, and when I'm feeling frisky, sociologist, has a bit of a problem with named queerness and strictly defined queer identities. Why does Judith Butler hate the metaphor of the closet? Let's check out their words. Is the subject who is out free of the closet subjection and finally in the clear? Or could it be that the subjection that subjectivates the gay or lesbian subject in some ways continues to oppress or oppresses most insidiously once outness is claimed? For being out always depends to some extent on being in. It gains its meaning only within that polarity. Basically, the but is saying that if we incorporate this concept of being out of the closet as fundamental to queer experience, in a way, we incorporate the closet itself into queerness. Well, they know that coming out of the closet is a real experience that happens. Butler warns that there's a danger to saying queerness and the closet are fundamentally and essentially linked. 
we end up defining ourselves in the terms of the tools of oppression, which kind of gives those tools powers. And you can trust me because I'm wearing a shirt. By universalizing the closet, we might accidentally give power to the closet forces that oppress queer experience and expression. If queerness is defined by outness, then that gives more power to the idea of inness and the closet as an eternal binary. When that binary doesn't really have to be all that eternal. Judith's overall problem with the closet isn't just about the closet. They expand on the idea. They critique the idea that queer identity should be a stable and coherent concept because a stable and coherent idea of queer identity necessitates the regulation of human bodies. So Judith's thoughts are a little complex here, but in their work, Imitation and Gender Subordination, they describe how traditionally homosexuality is thought of as this derivative of heterosexuality. Like hetero is this origin and homo is this derived thing that branches off from it. But through history, we know that this homo is a derivative of hetero statement just isn't the case. In fact, the idea of a heterosexual identity only came into existence after some Austrian-Hungarian defined heterosexual as the opposite of the other word he made up homosexual. And yet underlying the narrative of Western sexuality, there's this claim that heterosexuality is the origin point, the natural state, while homosexuality is seen as this degenerate derivative. Kind of metal though. Traditional views of society see gays as misguided offshoots of the heteros. Big if true, but unfortunately it isn't true. And it's actually incredibly small. The notion of sexuality as an individual identity is a modern concept. And the idea of gay and straight emerged alongside one another in the modern era. Gay and straight never existed on their own. They both emerged as terms to define each other. A uh, obligatory sentence about how people's experience of sexual attraction isn't socially constructed and isn't a choice, just that our labels and ways of conceiving that attraction is socially constructed. So heterosexuality isn't the origin point or the natural state because it's a socially constructed category despite tradition telling us otherwise. Well, what are we supposed to do now? Should we try to redefine queerness in its own terms? Um, the political problem is not to establish the specificity of lesbian sexuality over and against its derivativeness. So Butler is specifically talking about lesbians here, but it applies to all letters. Here Butler says, if we want to fight against the narrative that lesbianism is a derivative of heterosexuality, our goal shouldn't be to establish a specific lesbian identity. They continue but to turn the homophobic construction of the bad copy against the framework that privileges heterosexuality as origin. So again, we shouldn't establish a new specific lesbian identity to fight against the narrative of heterosexual origins. We shouldn't establish our queer identities with reference to heteronormative structures. We have to move past the narrative of heterosexual origins and move past the idea of categorizing people into strict identity categories. We have to move beyond the idea of a closet or any other discourse that centers heterosexual narratives of identity in the conversation. Wait, so what should we talk about, but? What should be the center? What? Enough of the but. What does this mean in terms of queerbaiting? Just let me cancel someone already. Think of the goals that critics of queerbaiting often advocate for. They want to see queer relationships consummated in the same way heterosexual relationships on screen are usually consummated. But um, here's the thing. Why are we supposed to define the standards for queer representation against what the heterosexuals are doing? And what are they doing? The f*** is Coldplay. Should queer movies and TV shows follow the exact same flawed tropes, plots, and structures that hetero media follows? The desire for queer representation often turns into a chase for the big kiss at the end of the story, but why that mold? I know groups of gay people for whom kissing is just a game, a meaningless act but for whom the real intimacy is in a prolonged stare, a handhold, a hug, and a playful exchange. Plus, has anyone else noticed that straight media kinda sucks? Really bro, Chris Pratt? You know, I don't really want queer media to turn into the mess of forced romantic subplots that plagues heterosexual stories. If our advocacy for queer representation ends with copying heterosexual stories and with us failing to offer queerness the opportunity to exist beyond hetero terms, 
then ultimately, aren't we kind of reproducing heterosexual culture? Do I want The Bachelor, but gay? American Sniper, but gay? Twilight, but gay? Well, that one might be fire. Okay, so what's the alternative? I am sick of the endless critique that exists in queer communities. Why don't we also get to turn off our brains to a mindless gay rom-com? Why do straight people get to live their lives and watch their stupid forced romances in every movie while queer people dress in their little purple outfits and go, wah, discourse, wah, heteronormative film tropes, wah. Okay, I get it. It's frustrating that our lives have to be defined by our relationships to systems of power and that not everyone has the privilege of critiquing all day but that doesn't mean that we need to abandon the critical lens. It's fun to imagine something different. Let's watch Butler, Judith quote a bald man. Indeed, Foucault might argue that the affirmation of homosexuality is itself an extension of a homophobic discourse. How so, Judith? Gay millennials love affirmations. Well, the dude she mentions, Foucault, was one of the most famous bald gay guys who studied how the idea of the identity category of homosexual only emerged in the 19th century to classify and marginalize people who didn't conform to traditional sexual roles. Okay, I buy it, I frick with that, but what do we do with that information? Indeed, a Foucauldian perspective might argue that the affirmation of homosexuality is itself an extension of a homophobic discourse. And yet, discourse, he writes on the same page, can be both an instrument and an effect of power, but also a hindrance, a stumbling block, a point of resistance, and a starting point for an opposing strategy. An opposing strategy. To recap, the exchange theory of queer. The idea that queer baiting is a failed exchange between audiences and creators. It doesn't work because to prove the creator's failure to deliver queer representation, audiences have to point to queer subtext, which is a type of queer representation, as proof of this failure. This creates a contradiction in the argument. The exchange theory also assumes that the delivery of queer representation is only legitimate if it falls in accordance with certain forms of representation, typically heterosexual modes of representation, thus reinforcing the heterosexual structures it seeks to critique. Presented with these points, you might be thinking, okay, uh, what's the alternative? We advocate for no one saying they're gay? We advocate for zero bro kisses? I get it. I snort bro kisses like cocaine. I can't live off the stairs of Ben-Hur and Rope. Well, what if I told you there was a way? A way to critique queer baiting in a manner that doesn't uphold or reinforce heterosexual tropes is the ultimate goal of representation. Here's my alternative. The discursive theory of queer baiting. The discursive theory of queer baiting defines queer baiting as an instrumentalized cinematic discourse on queer media that dislocates established and institutionalized queer cultural signifiers from history, causing an alienating effect between queer viewers and media. Creators who queerbait create works that enter into conversation with the language of queer subtext. But queerbaiting's engagement and use of queer subtext isn't the organic outcome of queer experience or community. These creators just want to profit. Here's an example of queer subtext that isn't queerbaiting. When Gore Vidal wrote gay subtext into Ben-Hur during the era of film censorship, he drew from his experience as a bisexual man to inform how the subtext would manifest. Not only was the subtext in Ben-Hur not queerbaiting, but it was also a genuine form of queer representation because it was real. It is queer representation because it genuinely expresses queerness in a particular historical context. But when modern queerbaiting writers insert queer subtext into their work, they enter the gay discourse with the intention of using queerness as an instrument for profit. And uh, I don't mean discourse like people literally talking to each other. Physical form is scary. I mean discourse in a theoretical sense, where discourse refers to culture as a collection of symbols that we use to convey meaning. And when I say symbols, I mean like everything, the language of cinema, shots, scripts, on-screen relationships, tension, dilfs. Queerbaiting is a thing when the symbols or discourse of queerness becomes hijacked by profiteers, where Gore Vidal genuinely represent queerness in his queer subtext. Queerbaiting creators are different in the ways they project a type of hologram of queer subtext. 
Queer viewers see this hologram. They understand it. But when they reach out and grab for substance, they're left empty-handed. The holographic projection of queer representation alienates queer viewers from media. It produces a malaise. Queer baiting isn't the projection of a false queerness. The queer subtext projected by queer baiting is queer. But when queer subtext is instrumentalized in the service of profit, it creates a disconnect between genuine queer viewers and queer baiting's commodified queerness. Like, you know when you're watching a high school theater show and the straight male lead is clearly a closeted gay teenager and there's just no way to suspend your disbelief and become engrossed in the story? Exactly. This is what happens when power controls any narrative. It alienates people from their own discourses and culture. Okay, cool, power control stuff. The discursive theory of queerbaiting tells us how this is done through Tumblr sexy men. So what's the end goal of a critique using the discursive theory to critique queerbaiting? What should the ideal piece of queer media look like if we're not asking for an exchange of services? Well, that's the thing. The solution isn't necessarily to put queer people in control of film narrative. We risk maintaining the same unjust hierarchies just with different people at the helm. Do we think appointing Jonathan Van Ness to the head of the US State Department would fundamentally alter international exploitation? If you just focus on recreating the meaning of an identity itself, then you fall into the trap of constructing a rigid version of queerness to which all creators and creations of queer media must fall under. Instead, what if we shifted the actual relation that identity has with the material and ideological structure of society? Queer theorists like Judith Butler and Michel Foucault say that queer control over queer narratives isn't liberation. Closing the meaning of any identity creates regulatory regimes that limit collective freedom and our full potential. The abstract aspiration of a discursive theory of queer meaning is to embrace queerness as defined by disruption. Not disruption as in how does queerness disrupt straightness. How do we disrupt the existing paradigm of repeated sexual role? Queerness is the disruption of dominant sexual roles and binaries. But to define this disruption strictly, to put a label and character on this disruption, to define it strictly is to miss the point. At that point, you're not disrupting the idea that categorizing human beings and assigning them life paths based on these categories is kind of bad. You're just relabeling something and calling it disruption. Instead, we need to move beyond the logic of human categories. Labels can exist in this world, but these labels should never mean the exact same thing for every person. Labels might simply identify the location of the disruption. The problem isn't just that straight people control the narrative. The problem is when narratives are controlled by any specific group of people or power. A narrative or symbol should instead be a site of constant discourse, contestation, and re-articulation within a collective or community. That way, you maximize the freedom of everyone to disrupt and contest how they want. And I'm talking about real freedom, not the type conservatives pretend they like. Instead, the type of utopian ideal that we'll never probably reach, but that we should always strive for where there's no hierarchies or coercion and we just kind of Maybe you don't like this version of the world. That's fine, it's just one version. Even I'm skeptical of how we would even get there. But can I at least propose that we find a way to look beyond the existing structures of control that exist and that we don't simply reinforce existing power structures but in a gay way. Again, look into the butt. This is not to say that I will not appear at political occasions under the sign of lesbian, but that I would like to have it permanently unclear what precisely that sign signifies. Maybe identity should be a site of constant contestation, thereby maximizing human agency and freedom. But Alexander, you definitely didn't say to the screen, give me a taste of this in the real world. Is there any example of this idea applied to media ever? We don't live in a free and open society, but is there something close to the idea? Well, Our Flag Means Death did a good job at representing queerness in an open, undefined, and kind of postmodern way. They didn't compromise the level of queerness for the sake of it being unnamed. In this show, queerness was simultaneously front and center while also remaining undefined. But I guess that's all to say we should aspire for a queerness in terms of social disruption. 
not in the terms of a strictly defined sexual identity. Reproducing strict sexual regimes is kind of cringe. Aspire towards genuine disruption. So uh, why did I just outline the history of queer cinema to support a pro-structuralist critique of a queer media phenomenon when really the world just wants to know whether they can cancel Harry Styles? Because here's what I established. The popular exchange theory of queer baiting, where we see queer cultural products as commodities to be exchanged between consumers and creators, doesn't work. A discourse version of queer baiting works better and accomplishes the goals the original exchange theory of queer baiting sought to make. Okay. Let's cancel some stuff, like Netflix users after Breaking Bad leaves. Let's pose the idea of a queerbaiting celebrity against both versions of queerbaiting to see if this idea of celebrity queerbaiting makes any sense. Let's try the based discursive one. Queerbaiting is an instrumentalized cinematic discourse on queer media that dislocates established and institutionalized queer cultural signifiers from history, causing an alienating effect between queer viewers and media. Okay, cool. Is it possible to reconfigure this cinematic critique thing so that it applies to celebrities? Queerbaiting is an instrumentalized public discourse on queer culture that dislocates established and institutionalized queer cultural signifiers from history, causing an alienating effect between queer audiences and celebrities. How do we define public discourse on queer culture when it involves individuals? Clothes? Flags? Words? I mean, theoretically, clothes, flags, and words may carry connotations, obviously. I didn't spend three weeks researching Doc Martens for nothing. But the act of labeling specific individual actions as queer is a form of regulating what is and isn't queer. And should we really be regulating what queerness is and isn't? Who has the authority over that? What number am I supposed to call for that? Four? With film language, labeling queerness is much easier since the history of queer subtext has been laid out so clearly by film historians and we can point to the specific conditions which led to subtext presence. Discussions on queerbaiting in a film context concerns fictional elements on screen with a history. Discussions on the celebrity version of queerbaiting, if it exists, concerns the practices of real people. Regulating and classifying fictional elements makes sense since these fictional elements come from a specific history, context, and setting. Gore Vidal told us, bro, but classifying and regulating the actions of real people? How do you even do that when queer is so dependent on social context, location, time, person, and even city? Is Harry Styles wearing a dress a genuine disruption or an instrumentalized idea of queerness? What about straight guys who put on black nail polish and listen to MCR to attract the experimental crowd? Okay, okay, maybe a little malicious, but are they queer baiting? And if they're queer baiting, are we going to start regulating other people's nails and only allowing queer people to wear nail polish? Is that stereotyping queerness? Should we control nails? Discourse? Tweet? Hell, there's no way to know the answer to any of these questions, but I do know that we can't start regulating which people can and can't use queer aesthetics because it boxes certain practices into strict categories that we then have to use to regulate people's actions. We don't want that. I'll explore this further in like 10 minutes. What else does the discursive theory of queerbaiting tell us? Do Harry Styles' practices, or any other queerbaiting celebrities' practices, alienate queer audiences from queer culture? Does a celebrity's private sexual orientation even have anything to do with how their potential disruption of gender and sexual roles is perceived? Just look at Prince. Despite the everything, he was notoriously heterosexual. In fact, he was quite homophobic. Yet, he dressed like this. Millions of queer people have been inspired by his bold style, confidence, and disruptive capabilities. His homophobia... inspiration. Just kidding. Homophobia bad, definitely. But it's silly to deny that he inspired a lot of people's queerness. Did Prince, through his staunch heterosexuality, alienate queer audiences from their own culture when he clearly inspired so many queer people's gender nonconformity, including mine? Using the term queer baiting just seems inadequate as a term for the situation. Even under the popular exchange theory of queer baiting, the critique of a celebrity via the word queer baiting doesn't make any sense. What exactly is the item being exchanged? Do celebrities promise to sell their sexual identities? Kind of, I mean like celebrities are kind of brands, but 
Does that brand include sexual identity when the brand is a person? Is the sexual identity promised? Is it expected? Is it right to expect anyone to promise to sell their identity, especially when some individuals don't fall under traditional, strictly defined identity categories? The term queerbaiting as a critique of celebrity queer appropriation promises more confusion than clarity. So why even bring it up? Why didn't I start this video with this point? Because queerbaiting, though an inadequate term for the situation, hints at what I think is a better critique of certain celebrities or individuals. Now that we understand the specificity of queerbaiting, we can identify the real tension between critics and celebrities. In either version of queerbaiting, both definitions assume the following about the idea of queer representation. That queerness is not simply an identity that expresses the experience of an individual person, but that queerness is a cultural construct that can be represented, talked about, and signified. This is the radical potential of any critique of queerbaiting. We usually think of queerness as a form of self-expression or self-identification, but the thought behind the term Queerbaiting suggests that queerness has a social and historical character. Within the exchange theory of queerbaiting, this idea doesn't reach its full potential. But in the discursive theory of queerbaiting, criticisms of queerbaiting have the potential to become an opposing force to power and money's instrumental control over queer discourse. Jargon, words, is someone gonna say capitalism already? Please, just, just, just get it over with. So this is where our critique of so-called queerbaiting celebrities might begin but we can't call it queerbaiting anymore because that word is inadequate and unnecessarily provocative. I know Zoomers love that word, but we forget that words like queerbaiting are historically situated. Let's just actually talk about what we're talking about. Instead of using random terms and then fighting over the terms, and then fighting over the people fighting over the terms, and then fighting over the terms for the people fighting over the people fighting over the terms. <laughs> Please, 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 I wanna cancel someone today, please. All right, woke mob. You guys are cool, but let's just have a little chat. I'll first be charitable and present the best version of why so-called queerbaiting celebrities might deserve criticisms. Here's one version. It's bad when non-queer people participate and or control queer discourses, aesthetics, and cultures. In an ideal world, only queer people should participate and control queer discourses, aesthetics, and cultures. Okay, so oftentimes I see a lot of people comment that only queer people should speak on this issue. There's this idea in progressive spaces that only people from certain communities should participate in discourses on those communities. Well, my question is, hold your tweets, why? I'm not saying that it's a particularly bad idea. In theory, most people affected by certain issues will often have the most valuable or important things to say about these issues. And the stakes aren't just internet debate, but oftentimes the life and death of a community. I get it. But let's explore this idea a bit. This way of thinking is called identity politics. Identity politics is a pretty loosely defined term. For Cucker Tarlsons, it's the end of the free world. For Marxists, it's a cringe distraction. For progressives, it's like snorting a line of serotonin. But what is it? Uh, no one knows exactly except for YouTubers. Identity politics is the broad idea of people forming political coalitions based around identity classes like race, gender, religion, nationality, sexual orientation, class, etc. And with a definition like that, it's starting to sound like everything's identity politics, huh? Joe Biden does identity politics when he's being weird. And you ain't black. Cucker Tarlson loves identity politics when it's about Western civilization. I mean, they tell us to hate ourselves and our culture and our history. <coughs> Racist. Ben Shapiro likes it when it's about being a little bit. This boy. This boy. We find identity politics wherever we look for it. So what's the real poop? Here are some things identity politics is useful for. Organizing and forming alliances. Things identity politics is bad for. Organizing and forming alliances. Bringing people together based on shared experiences can be kind of awesome and useful. For example, single-issue gay activism in the 1970s was really effective in motivating legal changes to sodomy laws in the US. But at the same time, these legal changes brought about by single-issue gay activism 
often failed to account for how poor queer people of color needed more material and targeted activism. Gay activists in the 1970s practiced identity politics by saying, hey, we can't focus on issues of race or class. We need to focus on gay issues if we want to be effective. But this had the effect of turning gay activism into a white middle class, white club. Because the problem is, when we focus on identity as a way of organizing politically, we end up having to define that identity in a way that excludes other social forces. We become blind to how identity groups are actually pretty unstable, contested, and constantly changing. Our modern notion of homosexuality, as I mentioned before, didn't even exist before the 19th century. Homosexual practices didn't used to be associated with a fundamental identity like homosexual. Gay practices just used to be practices that some people had the inclination to do. That doesn't mean people with same-sex attraction didn't exist, but that their same-sex attraction wasn't labeled. It wasn't an identity. It wasn't a category of human being. That's just not how 18th century weirdos rolled. I have an attraction to Hershey's dipped pretzels, but I'm not a Hershey sexual. Yet for some reason, in the late 19th century, we decided to start labeling people by their sexual attractions, and now we pretend like these sexualities are stable, universal categories when they're actually really socially contingent. So through this whole debate, I'm also going to offer a bit of a criticism of identity politics. Not as a Marxist who claims that class is the ultimate social struggle, not as a Jordan Peterson who frames identity politics as the fall of the West, nor am I going to criticize identity politics completely as a concept. I just want to provide a criticism from the left that isn't actually only class matters and that also isn't, let's just hold hands and vibe. Like Judith Butler, we have to use a little post-structuralism. What the f is post-structuralism? I thought that it was gonna be cancel fest. I don't wanna use words, whatever. Back to the chalkboard. It's actually not that hard. Here's structuralism. So structuralism is like a school of thought in social theory. It originally belonged to linguistics people, but they're all gay and dead, so now it belongs to gayer sociologists. The main idea that structuralists hold is that society has a fixed concrete structure. That's it. Structuralists claim that society has laws, it follows a pattern, is a thing that does a thing, and to an extent this social structure determines how human life plays out. Marx was a kind of structuralist, he thought that society was structured by the conflict between classes and that this formed a kind of grand narrative of class struggle. People who subscribe to identity politics usually subscribe to some kind of structural thinking. Not structuralism per se, but most identity politicians agree that identity categories are stable points in a social system. I'd say that most progressives are probably some brand of structuralist. Structuralism isn't bad. In fact, it's kind of right about a lot of things. But some French people in the 20th century made us all ask, what if we made this harder to understand but in a cool way? Okay, enter post-structuralism. Stage left, far left. Post-structuralism isn't really a concrete idea, which actually means it's a perfect representation of what it describes. Post-structuralism just describes any critique of structuralism. You can be a post-structuralist and still think that some structures determine human life and behavior, but a post-structuralist critiques some fixed aspect of structuralism. A post-structuralist might say, Hi Marx, some good ideas. Can we just uh, circle back on a few things? Isn't it kind of hard to box human nature into a single grand narrative of class? What about the ways class is destabilized by race? And gender? And why do you view the world in terms of work and labor? Isn't there more? Hasn't language also been really important in structuring the world, to be honest? And isn't language pretty unstable and subject to change? Essentially, structuralism stabilizes meaning, and post-structuralism destabilizes it. Judith Butler is a post-structuralist. They're queer. They've taken the public intellectual picture with their hand perched on their chin. They believe in queer liberation in a way, but their vision for queer liberation isn't based in identity politics. They believe that the attempt to classify queerness kind of undermines the whole idea of queer liberation. They oppose any type of regulation, any strict definition of queerness that isn't based on disruption. Is it ever wrong to organize under a queer or gay label? 
I'm sure it's useful. Gay single issue activism has made meaningful differences in people's lives. The problem is when we risk defining gay or queer as a single thing, when in fact it's a socially and historically contingent signifier that encompasses a diverse part of the human experience. I'm not saying that we should let straight people speak. The idea is to move beyond the queer and non-queer binary as a strict universal category. Straight and gay are not universal categories of person that have existed throughout all human history. And even though they exist now, the fact of their social construction indicates that their meaning is subject to change. So why should we actively seek to stop that change? Our critiques of commodified queerness should not respond to commodification by classifying and regulating queerness in response. We shouldn't protect queerness as if gay is this pure universal category with a distinct essence. Instead, we should push back on how commodification seeks to define queerness in a way that privileges a single understanding of the human. Classifying humans into identity categories? So 20th century. But hey, if that identity category is useful for you, that's cool. But I think we all know how tricky these categories can be. They never mean the same exact thing to anyone and we should stop pretending like they do. No one asks, so I'll just, why don't queer people ever get accused of straight baiting? What happens when a gay guy looks like this? Straight baiting isn't a thing because there is no way to look straight because our society says that straight is just neutral. It's unmarked. So if we're out here calling everyone that falls a little out of the norm queer baiting, doesn't that kind of reinforce the idea that queer people are only connected to each other in the way that they're different to straight people? And doesn't that kind of end up centering straight people as an original reference point? Society compels us to repeat patterns and roles associated with certain identities, ultimately forcing people to live limited lives where their actions only end up representing the dominant systems of power. So how do we refuse the control of a system of power and binaries? I don't think we accomplish this refusal by just inverting it and inverting the binary. It's just a little weird to me that any time an artist does anything slightly transgressive of gender and sexual norms like, say, I like girls on an Instagram post, a good portion of the internet immediately goes to ask, Hey, can you say that? Do you pass the gay test? We're letting these categories define how people are allowed to experience the world when these categories are human inventions. I don't want there to be a gay test. In fact, it's gayer to fail the gay test than to pass any stinky test. <sighs> Whatever. Let's have some fun. Hey Harry Styles. You could say he's a dude, a guy in fact, but he also exists at the intersection of about 30,000 irritating tweets that at this point, I'm starting to believe are written by the same seven people. But he's a good case study in ambiguity. So how does the accused stand? I'm not going to go over everything Harry Styles has been criticized for ever. He could be a terrible person, but I wanna use him as a specific case of a specific thing. So we're only going to talk about this queer baiting business. Is Harry Styles commodifying queerness? The other day, Twitter told me that he's the bastion of gender fluidity and that his status as an unlabeled but in the gay way makes him the next king of pop. Or is he the next king of poop? After all, Twitter told me that he's just a heterosexual who uses queer aesthetics to profit off of his queer audience. As I've demonstrated in this video, queer baiting as a term just seems a little too 2000 and late to really apply it in a real person context. But does Harry play a role in commodifying queer culture and in letting power rather than genuine human agency and freedom control queer narratives. Do his actions represent a genuine disruption? Right, Harry isn't the first to wear traditionally feminine or queer-coded clothing as a pop star. Some bring up the fact that artists of color have been doing this shit long before Harry got his little grippers on the worst outfits on earth. That's fair, but his critics don't just point to his style as evidence of his wrongdoing. There's a whole narrative around Harry, a queer narrative. Here are the facts. Harry Styles has experimented with queer-coded clothing styles. Exhibit A. Harry Styles intentionally promotes queer artists. Exhibit B. It is well known Harry Styles has a large queer fan base. Exhibit C. 
Harry frequently displays queer flags at his shows. Exhibit D. Harry's previous song lyrics have hinted at him having same-gender relations. Exhibit E. Oh no. And how could Harry do all this with a wink and a shimmy and not give a single comment on the matter? As if he doesn't care. As if he's- Oh, uh, sorry. He, uh, he actually has commented on it, actually. Several times, to be honest. Am I sprinkling nuggets or sexual ambiguity to try and make it more interesting? No. Okay, I'll do the real voice. No. In terms of how I want to dress and what the album sleeve is going to be, I tend to make decisions in terms of collaborators I want to work with. I want things to look a certain way. Not because it makes me look gay or it makes me look straight or it makes me look bisexual, but because I think it looks cool. And more than that, I don't know, I just think sexuality is something that's fun. Honestly, I can't say I've given it any more thought than that. I've been really open about my sexuality with my friends, but that's my personal experience. It's mine, he said. The whole point of where we should be heading, which is toward accepting everybody and being more open, is that it doesn't matter. And it's about not having to label everything, not having to clarify what boxes you're checking. Okay, well on paper, According to Harry, he isn't using queerness in the service of something else. But when we put the narrative of Harry Styles all together, what do we get? I don't think we get what people want to get. He claims that he's gone through a journey of sexuality and that he doesn't want to label where this journey has led him. But the public demands a firm answer. Out of a morbid curiosity, out of a feeling of public ownership of celebrity, out of a politic of identity that demands of us to claim our memberships. I understand the argument. People aren't just calling Harry a baiter because he wears frilly pirate outfits. He's explicitly criticized queer media and used queer symbols in explicit ways. He's directly engaging with the discourse of queerness, but he hasn't claimed or rejected the queer identity, which for some is off-putting. But Harry doesn't just receive profit and buzz. It's not all sunshine and non-referential rainbows for Mr. Styles. I don't think we should pretend as if Harry Styles pays no price for his engagement with nonconformity. He faces the same conservative backlash that other gender or sexual nonconforming artists have faced. There is no society that can survive without strong men. The East knows this. In the West, the steady feminization of our men at the same time that Marxism is being taught to our children is not a coincidence. It is an outright attack bring back manly men. This is perfectly obvious. Anyone who pretends that it is not a referendum on masculinity for men to don floofy dresses is treating you as a full-on idiot. Because in some ways, Harry Styles represents a genuine disruption of gender and sexual roles at a level of mainstream fame that few have achieved. But do we have the right to demand an extra step? I want to propose that we celebrate disruption, but not to the point of confusing the celebration of disruption with regulation. On this topic, some readers of the New York Times wrote responses to an article about the Harry Styles discourse. Here's one. Mr. Styles' sexual identity is his own business and I don't think any of us should be pushing him to come out. But if Mr. Styles is to continue to be a queer icon, I think it is fair that queer fans ask more of him. To be more vocal in condemning transphobia and homophobia, to be vocal about queer politics of liberation, to ask for more support for queers of color and those without Mr. Styles' privilege, and to use his celebrity voice to show critical solidarity with queer communities who have supported his rise to stardom. Centering the question around whether or not Harry is queer baiting limits the possibilities of our critique. Using an identity politics approach here actually isn't really helpful because all it does is push us to categorize people and regulate which behaviors they can and can't do without questioning those behaviors themselves. Would the totality of Harry Styles still be okay if he was gay? The clothes would be fine either way. Who hasn't dressed like a bisexual sophomore at a New England art college who clearly makes their own clothes? But if Harry were gay, and we accepted his actions as genuine queer expression, then are we just going to move on and let him still do what he does? I don't think we should. You remember his comments about movies where he implied gay lovemaking was kind of cringe? It's as if he stands for a version of queerness that accepts all the cuteness of the frilly clothes and playful lyrics, 
but rejects the raw gay lovemaking, the work of liberation, the prospect of suffering, the baggage of a queer label. He hasn't necessarily rejected these items, but he hasn't exactly endorsed them or supported them. In that sense, his persona represents a type of brand-friendly queerness that maintains the status quo. Whether he is gay or straight, this remains the case. There's fair reason to criticize Harry for upholding the status quo. And if you want to criticize the ways people reproduce existing hierarchies, be my guest. But the conversation needs to stop focusing on his identity and regulating actions based on invented human categories. When you focus on problematizing the labeled identity of the person speaking, you reframe the conversation in terms of human control. Not just for the celebrity, but I think it affects the way we think about other human beings. Humans, rather than structures, become the object of regulation. We end up universalizing the idea of rigid sexual categories and limit the possibilities available to people. And we don't even accomplish the queer liberation we claim to support. This doesn't necessarily mean we have to ignore positionality. We should all be conscious about how our characteristics like race, gender, class, and ability bias our worldview. That's extremely important. But that doesn't mean we have to go back to a framework that uses these characteristics to strictly regulate action. Instead, we should picture a framework that disrupts how these characteristics and binaries restrict the freedoms of those most oppressed by structures of power. If you want to criticize Harry Styles, Frame the conversation around the substance of his disruption. Where is Harry Styles disrupting the status quo, and where is he reproducing it? His gender nonconformity presents a threat to the stability of masculine and feminine roles in the mainstream eye. That's a thing, and I think everyone should have access to these destabilizing roles. But Harry is a rich white dude who sits atop of a structure of power. His role as the beneficiary of a capitalist social order influences the extent to which he can disrupt it. His disruption can only go so far, and his interests lie with those at the top who ironically benefit from rigid identity categories. Is he intentionally evil? Probably not. Does his brand represent somewhat of a disruption? Sure, but it will always be limited. Does Harry Styles represent a moment where power and money redirects queer discourses and cultures? Yeah, definitely. But the influence of power would exist regardless of his identity. Queer people have instrumentalized and commodified queerness before. Do we allow them to do it just because they're queer? I don't think so. The question is not one of avowing or disavowing the category of lesbian or gay, but rather why is it that the category becomes the site of this ethical choice? Accusers of queerbaiting tend to criticize the right people for the wrong reasons, and in the end, their criticisms end up in the wrong place. There's this tendency to essentialize identity, to attach universal or even spiritual meanings to identities that we know are socially constructed. Critics frame queer as having this single meaning. We end up regulating and forcing people into choosing these identities as if they're universals hiding in our hearts when they're socially contingent and constantly in flux. It reinforces this dichotomy. Straight people do one thing and gay people do another. Why are you telling people to do things based on socially contingent hierarchies? Why are you canvas? But identity politics is awesome, and forcing rules around discourse works for the people we want to liberate. Except sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it puts people in unnecessarily uncomfortable situations. The author of the gay YA book, Simon vs. the Homo Sapiens Agenda, Becky Albertalli, says she felt forced to come out as bisexual after Twitter users accused her of being a straight woman profiting off of the LGBTQ community. On the matter, she stated, this doesn't feel good or empowering or even particularly safe. Honestly, I'm doing this because I've been scrutinized, subtweeted, mocked, lectured, and invalidated just about every single day for years, and I'm exhausted. After a lyric video of one of her songs included same-gender couples kissing, online critics accused singer Dove Cameron of queerbaiting her audience. In response, she came out as queer. When the song came out, everybody got the idea that the song was a big LGBTQ plus anthem song, and I found myself in this position where everybody thought I was queerbaiting. I've hinted about my sexuality for years while being afraid to spell it out for everybody. 
When actress Jamila Jamil was cast as a judge for an upcoming voguing competition show, Legendary, she received backlash for presumably being a straight woman taking up space in a traditionally queer context. She came out as queer shortly after. Twitter is brutal. This is why I never officially came out as queer. I kept it low because I was scared of the pain of being accused of performative bandwagon jumping over something that caused me a lot of confusion fear and turmoil when I was a kid. It's also scary as an actor to openly admit your sexuality, especially when you're already a brown female in your 30s. Actor Tyler Posse was accused of queer baiting after admitting to having had relations with men. After years of harassment from individuals online, he felt the need to be explicit about his identity as sexually fluid. They're trying to call me a gay baiter, pretending to be gay to get money essentially. He claimed that the same individuals who accused him of queerbaiting made this one comment that kind of sparked me wanting to do something about cyberbullying, he says. They said, I killed your mother. Like this person actually claimed they killed my mother. Okay, let, let's not tell people we killed their mother. Listen, I'm not saying we need to pity the poor rich celebrities. A lot of these people deserve criticism for things. We've all done things, and these celebrities are no exception. But centering someone's identity places us in the position of regulating human bodies. Though the circumstances are different, this logic of identity regulation is the same logic that guides homophobia, racism, transphobia, sexism, and other forms of bigotry. Like, I'm not saying identity politics is bigotry, but that sometimes they can be guided by the same logic. It's this idea that identity inherently, fundamentally, essentially, tells us the most information about a person. When that's not always true, what I am criticizing is different than the reasonable position of acknowledging that identity affects your biases and how you view the world. That is undeniable. The issue is when we attach ethical and essential weight to human classification. When we say, if you hold this identity, that always and inherently is a marker of the substance of who you are and what you do. That's kind of a barrier to where we want to go because when we do that, it allows us to pretend like these identities are written into the fabric of the universe and it lets us forget that these identities are social constructs that emerged out of a specific history and system of power. Like I said, a lot of the times, identity is a useful way of looking at systems of power. We shouldn't abandon identity politics completely. Otherwise, how would we track when bias against certain identities affects our decision making or institutions? But identity shouldn't always be the center of our politics. Identity politics is a lens, a strategy from which to point out the larger structural issues having to do with oppressed races, genders, classes, and orientations. It is a means to an end, not an end in itself. Let's reframe the question of, is the person exploiting LGBTQ plus culture queer? To, is the person exploiting LGBTQ plus culture? So what should you do with your life? It's totally fine to be aware and to point out your privileges and biases and the privileges and biases of others, and even how our identities affect all of our worldviews. Hey Jeremy, maybe you shouldn't be playing devil's advocate in this lecture on American slavery. So when we're talking about queer baiting celebrities or Harry Styles, let's maybe move the discourse somewhere else. Would the substance of Harry Styles' actions change if he decided to label his identity? Would that make his comments on queer media any better? Would it change the fact that thousands of queer women feel connected to his work and persona? If you want to center identity into your politics, I can't stop you. I'm not here to convert you to a post-structuralism or a gay communism, but I can at least advise you that you remain a little reflexive on what it means to hold discourses about identity. We can't risk recreating regulatory regimes when it is the project of queer liberation to demand disruption. Will queer politics in the next decade become a game of classification or critique? You decide. Hey, gay. You want to act gaily daily? Well, here's a few ways you can do that. Support this channel by checking out my merch at www.itsall.gay or consider supporting me on Patreon. Also, remember to follow my Twitter, Tumblr, and Instagram. Don't forget to subscribe. Anyways, these are some people who are acting gaily daily. 
My patrons Enoch Ku, Aaron Seiler, Adeline Grubb, AFK Bard, Aiden Iftikar, Akane SVT, Alice H, Allison, Alston, Amanda Hesella, Amanda S, Amara, Amelia Zeke, Anarkali Ascari, Andy H, Anarik, Armin Newsom, Ashby A, Asimpti, Aurelia Chilinska, Autumn Moore, Avery, B, Paleography, Batia Rabin, Ben the Bard, Bianca Moten, Brad the Great, Brian Lasoya, Brianna Rodriguez, Brooke, Bump Girl, Violet, Cara Miller, Carla Carroll, Cartwheel, Catboy Girl, Kay Clark, Cece Troya, Charles Hero, Charlotte, Chester Snap, Chris Hubley, Crispy, Cillin Trouble, Clara Lindner, Cody Miller, Coisim, Colin Coltrera, Conscious Logic, Cooper, Cucumber, Kurt Lark, Cynthia Perez, Sivis, D. Ann, Dairy Dude, Dane Much, Danny Chalice, Daniel Montgomery, Daniel Prokop, Darren Mad, Daisy Granados, De Cassavary, Del Elliott, Drainix, E. Aesthetic, Alana Bellows, Elena Amescua, Ellen, Elizabeth Acosta, Elizabeth Morgan, Ellie Marks, Emily, Emily Blue, Emma Anastasi, Esper Lady, Ethan Thompson, Etienne, Evan P, Evelyn Rose Connor, everyone took the funny names, Extra Virgin Olive Oil, Farinac Kashmiri, Feeler, Florencia Rodriguez, Frida Jimenez, Gabriella Bradley, Gabriella Day, Garrett Black, Georgia, Georgia Rose, Gina Wallace, Grace, Graham Colbeans, Hadley Grace, Hannah O, Hannah G0123, Heather Frazechild, Enardo Dominguez Elvira, How the Magician, I Am the Fern Man, Ian T. Gray, Angela's Whipfelder, It's a Me, Emily, Izzy the Alien, Jack, Jackie Benavente, Jacob T. Rapp, Jaime, JT, Jake the Snake Bakes a Cake by the Lake, Janin, J Herod, J. Patrick, Jennifer M. Isaguirre, Jesse, Jessica Carmona, Jessica Pan, Justin 3, Jonah Bork, Jonathan De Vicente, Juicebox08, Julian Casper, June, Jurassic Dragon, Justin Chapman, Just Some Sentient Matter, Ka, K, Kale, Caleb, Karen Mullen, Casacist, Kara, Kimmy Giggler, Knights Who Say Sledge, Cosmosar, Kuro, Kyle Denley, Laura V. Turner, Lauren Taylor, Lee O, Leela, Leonardo Sardinianis, Levi Margolis, Lily, Lillian, Lily, Lilytron, Lindsay Laney, Linz, Little Pihuyo, Liz Hirschman, Log, Lorenzo J. Yanez Jr., Luca Alexander, Lucia Garcia, Luke Grease Shaber, Mackenzie Robin, Madeline, Maggie H., Matey, Malpertuis, Manway, Mark Kirby, Margot White, Maria Raposa Branca, Marie, Marta, Matthew Franklin, Megalomaniac64, Megan, Maggie and Lars, Mejun, Mel, Melonbug, Mary, Merle, Meek Van Corbin, Miguel Galan de Juana, Mika, Miranda, Moye, Mysterious DG, Mysterious Persona, Nadine Ferris, Natasha Troom, Nicholas Bloom, Nick, Nick, Nifan, Omni Technomancer, Oyster Philosophy, Paige, Paul, Powell Pergat, Pa Timer, Perdita, Peter Patrick and Mary, Palates, Pop Unicorn, RBE, Rafe, Ray J, Rebecca Blask, Rebecca McCann, Red Sparky, RH, Richard Knight, River M, 
Roman Rosari, Ronja Adams Ramstead, Rosemory of the Sea, Rowan, RSS, Rising Sun, Salea, Sam Cotter, Sam Kilkenny, Samantha Bonaparte, Scrimbim, Sebastian Rose, Sathame Bitch, Shandon Largo, Shane Tilla Karatne, Shannon Hutchinson, Shannon M, Shivanji Sikri, Sid, Sanai Cruz, Cece, Slightly M, Solborg Birgis Doder, Suit Sprite, Soup, Soya Sora, Stacy Every, Steffi, Steven, Steve Markham, Sunny Latome, Sydney Peterman, Tangerine 15, Tanya P, Ted, Taylor White, The Kimchi Witch, The Salsa, Thomas Oshagan Halagian, Tiff, Talora, Thomas Tripp, Tyler Connolly, Umaima Beige, Valerie Astra, Venom Titties, Veronica Jarasova, Violet Fabiana, Wainoa, Whitney Welts, Ren Martin, Zylon Akau MSTS. You're doing a great job. Your mom.